Okay. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Innocent Odongo, the Secretary General of the International Young Catholic Students, uh, famously known as the IYSSJC, and I'm honored to be your moderator for this webinar today. Uh, we would like to welcome you all to this webinar title, Last Call to Achieve Climate Targets, a faith-based look at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that's the IPCC AR6 synthesis report ahead of COP28. The fact that you are here today makes us very happy. And uh, let me quickly outline the webinar structure before we get started. Uh, there will be two uh, sessions with three speakers in each. After each session, we are going to take questions uh, from the audience. And therefore, you are invited in the audience to write your questions in the chat. Uh, the Q&A will be about five minutes to exchange with our distinguished final, panelist. And finally, um, Gina Castillo, a colleague from the organizing uh, uh, committee will help us to shed more light on the uh, see, judge and act uh, through the presentation of the public statement for this webinar. And now at this moment, uh, I welcome Father Eduardo Agosta, the Laudato Si Movement Senior Advisor to provide insight on this webinar's theme. Uh, Father Eduardo, over to you. Thank you, Innocent, for your welcoming words. Good day, everyone. Welcome to this webinar. We all might know that Pope Francis, in his last message for the care of day for uh, of prayer for the care of creation on September the 1st, 2022 clearly pointed to the climate summit that was about to be held in Egypt, the COP27. In it, he summoned all nations to a collective ecological conversions in terms of joining in promoting the effective implementation of the Paris Agreement. He further recognized that the effort to achieve the Paris goal of limiting temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius is quite demanding. However, Ecological conversion is, according to the Pope, a call for responsible cooperation between all nations in presenting climate plans or more ambitious nationally determined contributions in order to reduce to zero as quickly as possible net greenhouse gas emissions. How much have we achieved this ecological conversion that climate targets established in Paris Samonas? What are the next steps to follow up to overcome the climate crisis that we are facing currently? Backed by science and guided by the light of faith, we want to delve deeper into these issues. We have recently received the IPCC synthesis report of the sixth cycle of scientific reports that were published between 2018 and 2022. Climate science has spoken once more, as it did before the arrival of the Paris Agreement in 2015. We want to see, judge, and act in order to call on our governments to find real and concrete ways of solutions, given that they have their main responsibility to care for their citizens, especially the most vulnerable, and to care for this earth, our common home. Let's attentively then hear our invited speakers today who have great knowledge to share with us. Thank you again for all of you being in sharing in this webinar. Thank you, uh, Father Eduardo, uh, for giving us insight into the theme of this webinar. I now have the pleasure to welcome and introduce our first guest speaker for today, Dr. Matilde Rusticucci, an Argentine climate scientist she has contributed to multiple IPCC reports and is the primary author of the AR6 Working Group 2. Uh, Dr. Rusticucci is a professor at the University of Buenos Aires, uh, who has authored multiple climate change research articles and book chapters. She is a well-known expert in the field who has lectured on climate change and extreme weather occurrences in a number of countries. We are delighted to welcome her as a guest speaker However, she was unable to join us today. She has pre-recorded a video, a statement to share with us. 
And as climate scientist from the IPCC, uh, she will share with us in the video what she believes are the most significant findings of the AR6 synthesis report, and also our thoughts on these and how they can help to inform global climate policy. Uh, Father Eduardo, please, uh, may you share the video? Hello, thank you for inviting me to bring you some headlines of the recently published synthesis report of the IPCC 6 assessment report. We know, I'm sharing my screen. Okay. Uh, I think that the most significant findings of these reports are this one. The first one that we, we know that human activities I unequivocally cost global warming and that global surface temperature has been reached 1.1 degrees above pre-industrial times. This warming has caused adverse impacts, several adverse impacts in different sectors like water availability and food production, health and well-being in general, cities, settlements and infrastructure everywhere, and also biodiversity and ecosystems. These impacts are driven by changes in multiple physical climate conditions that are increasingly attributed to human influence. We know that um, the increase in agricultural and ecological drought, in fire weather, in compound flooding, or heavy precipitation over world glacier retreat, global sea level rise, increasing hot extremes are, are attributed to human influence. So we know also that vulnerable communities who have historically contributed the least to current climate change are disproportionately affected by these impacts. What has happened with the temperature? We know this is the representation of this annual mean global temperature from the beginning of the 20th century up to now. And we know that we are in the, the most warm decade over the whole period. And this is what would happen in the future, depending on the scenarios we, we achieve. If we, um, every scenario shows a warming, but these intermediate to very high scenarios show that warming continues beyond 2100. So depending on how we address climate change, the future experiences. And this is the representation of somebody who has born in his 50s, now is feeling this 1.1 degrees over pre-industrial times. But we thinking about people born in 2020 will experience different degrees of warming in the future when he will grow up. So this representation is clear to show that the warming depends on what we are doing, what we will do now. Also, we know that adaptation options that are feasible and effective today will become constrained and less effective with increasing global warming every increment in global warming will intensify multiple and concurrent hazards and impacts that became difficult to, to afford. So also we know that deep, rapid and sustained reductions in greenhouse gas emissions will lead to discernible slowdown in global warming within around two decades up to now. That's the urgent need to action. 
So in general, we know that climatic and non-climatic risk will increasingly interact, creating compound and cascading risk that are more complex and difficult to manage. So to conclude, global climate policy should understand that if we continue with these economic politics, the costs of recovering from negative impacts are greater than the cost of ch changing the current production model for one that stops emitting greenhouse gases. So thank you very much. Yes, we are very uh, grateful uh, for Dr. Rustikuchi, uh, short statement. Uh, she presented two important uh, findings from the report. Uh, first, uh, she highlighted that human activities, mainly greenhouse gas emissions, are to blame for global warming. And secondly, that vulnerable communities, which have historically contributed less to climate change, are more severely affected by its consequences. She also stretched that uh, adaptation measures uh, that are presently possible and effective may become less effective as global warming continues. And as a result, immediate action is required to decrease a greenhouse gas emission significantly, but also sustainably. And therefore, in the run-up to the next COP28, it is important for us as Catholic actors around the world and everyone living on this planet, as Pope Francis in his letter, Ezekiel letter, love that to see, uh, invites uh, us to take actions. It is also important for us to advocate for and encourage member states uh, to take deliberate and effective steps towards the objective of limiting temperature increases to 1.5 degrees C and also reducing net greenhouse gas emission uh, to zero. Now, uh, that being said, I will uh, welcome and introduce our next speaker, Mr. Neil uh, Thond, who is the Director of Advocacy and Communications at CAFOD. He's, he now leads CAFOD's efforts to address poverty and inequality, drawing on his vast experience working with non-governmental organizations. He also leads uh, the climate collusion, a collusion of over 120 groups aiming to combat climate change. We are very delighted uh, that he has agreed to share his thoughts uh, with us today. It's worth also noting that Neil was a previously a member of the OEC delegation at the last COP27 in Egypt. Uh, Mr. Uh, Thorns, the report warns that uh, global warming could exceed the 1.5 degrees C uh, by uh, 2030s. What are your thoughts on this? And what actions can governments, civil society organizations, and other stakeholders uh, take to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees C? And do you think that we are doing enough? Over to you, uh, Mr. Neil. Thank you very much, Innocent, and thank you very much for organising this really important um, uh, seminar uh, and webinar. I think it's really important. So, I mean, the simple answer to your question is depressingly no, uh, we are not doing enough. But if I can just share a couple of things, I'm just going to share my screen uh, to give you uh, a couple of ideas. So I'm going to concentrate a bit about the near term <clears throat> on it um, rather than the longer term. So... First of all, I think uh, we've got an implementation gap. So what, we, what we've heard from the IPCC AR6 report, as we've just heard from our colleague there, and this year we've got a global stock take. So the global stock take is where, uh, as part of the UNFCCC, the climate talks, they will be gathering all of the information that they've got about what governments have promised um, to uh, implement the Paris Agreement, and they will be taking that stock take across mitigation, adaptation, loss and damage, the techni technology, finance. So we will have a sense of what all governments are doing and we can compare that to the science and we can look at the gap. And we know that there'll be a gap because we know already the information is out there. But the important thing is that we will know that gap and we will have a couple of years run up to when governments have to submit their nationally determined contributions in 2025. So we hope that the gap that we'll have produced from the science report and from the global stock take will give us the, the information that we need to say to governments, right, that's where the ambition that you need to push for in your 2025 NDC submission. I think the second thing we've heard about mitigation. So it's absolutely critical 
that we reduce our emissions really uh, significantly over this next period, over this next decade. And so what we need is to, to make sure that we keep within that 1.5 degrees. So that means phasing out fossil fuels now. And it means also that we support, support emissions uh, peaking before 2025. So that's the second thing. We need urgent mitigation measures now. The third aspect around governments is the fact of we have fewer choices in a hotter world. So as temperatures increase, just as we've heard previously, that the things that we already have put in place around adaptation to a climate, um, to, to the climate crisis, they're going to work less and less as the temperatures get hot and hotter. They're effective today, but they won't be effective tomorrow or in a couple of years time. And equally, we know that loss and damage will increase over these years as the temperatures in, as the temperatures rise. So we need more money into, into adaptation funding, and we need, we need to make sure that the loss and damage fund, which was promised in the last COP, actually has adequate funding and good governance to make sure that that money goes to the poorest and reaches the poorest first and most importantly. So we need more money on adaptation. It's always the one which is uh, left behind. And there was promises made in the Glasgow COP to double adaptation funding and or to double the amount that goes to adaptation. So we need to make sure that there are very clear uh, follow throughs on those promises that we, we heard for in, in Glasgow. And then I think the last thing I would flag from a government point of view is we need a whole government approach. This isn't just about when we approach the kind of the, the negotiation spaces within the COP. So, for example, we need governments to stop all subsidies of fossil fuels now. Um, it's outrageous that the amount of subsidies I talk from the UK the amount of subsidies, subsidies that the UK government still gives into fossil fuels into our country. And we know that if we are going to meet, if we're going to try and keep within our 1.5 degree um, warming, we need to make sure that there are no new planned developments for fossil fuels. So nothing, no more, new, no more developments around fossil fuels. So we need to take away the subsidies and no more planned developments. We need urgent action on debt. We heard in the last kind of couple of years the urgent cry of countries who are suffering from debt repayments. We hear it from the small island states, we hear it from countries in Africa, we hear it across the world. So there needs to be a real action on debt. And as we approach 2025, which is a jubilee year for us Catholics, we need to think again about how we celebrate that jubilee year and really push for an extra with a with a concerted uh uh, action on cancellation of, of debt. And then the last thing is we need to invest in renewables. Um, and that's a simple fact. So it's the reverse of taking the subsidies out of fossil fuels. We need to put them into renewables and actually let's celebrate some of the progress which has been made. So the Inflation Reduction Act, I'm sure there are probably other people on the call who can speak much more eloquently about that than me. But at least it's a sign of progress in that the US is really trying to push and equally similar things are being done in the EU. I wish I could say the same in the UK. Um, unfortunately, we had a day today which was deeply disappointing of our UK government. Then I'm just going to touch on what civil society um, people can do. And I think this is still in terms of related to government. So I think the first thing is let's make sure that we are continuing to promote an ambitious narrative. There is a danger when we are getting up to being close, being close to missing a 1.5 degree uh, temperature rise. And we, we're kind of heading for two degrees. Everyone go, oh, well, we just got to go for two degrees now. We, we forget 1.5. No, no, no. We keep we keep the ambition and we keep it absolutely as strong and ambitious as we possibly can. Just because it, we may not hit it first, we're going to keep going until we get there. So we need to make sure that we are presenting and keeping that promotion of an ambitious narrative. We need an we need a Laudato Si approach. These things we need to we need to continue to promote an approach which talks about nature, which talks about climate, and which talks about people. These things are integrally linked. We hear that from Laudato Si. The problems are inter, in, are completely linked, and the solutions are completely linked. And actually, if you think about how um, the impact of conservation of forests and other ecosystems, they offer one of the largest ways 
of mitigation uh, potential for us to doing it. So we need to put those people, the forests and the climate together in that Laudato Si approach. We need to involve others. We need to involve business. Business are often way ahead. Some businesses are way ahead of governments in this space. So actually, how do we involve businesses and get them to equally urge government to take action? We've seen in the last, um, between 2010 and 2019, the costs of solar and wind, wind energy decreased hugely. So the unit cost of solar has decreased by 85% and wind energy by 55%. There is a revolution out there waiting if we can if we can invest in it and if we can make it positive. So let's work with business and let's kind of in the in the right business and let's push it. The fourth thing is let's take action politically and if we're doing it and if we're going to do it individually in our parishes if we're going to take action in our lifestyles let's take let's make sure that we tell those decision makers the action we're taking. And lastly Let's make sure that we think about this in terms of the culture of encounter. We know that climate change is a problem to be, which is shared across the whole world, and it's only going to be tackled successfully if we share that problem and do it jointly. So I hope that our push for civil society and for government is shared across the world, but that we really take an urgent and ambitious action on some of those things that we need to do in this next decade. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Neil. And uh, you are kind of identified that there will be a gap and there is gap already. And that means we have uh, the challenge to bridge uh, that gap. And uh, also to governments uh, need to stop uh, things like uh, subsidies and all that. But for also as civil societies uh, to do our best to continue to promote the ambitious narrative, which is very important. And also you identify the need for Lauda to see. And in this case, we are very grateful to Lauda to see movement for enabling us to come together today by providing us the Zoom uh, webinar uh, mode to, to come together to share our thoughts. Now I will uh, welcome our next speaker and our next speaker is Martha Piri, a climate justice advo advocate uh, and community development practitioner with over five years of expertise in sustainable environment and development. Uh, she's currently a policy research and advocacy coordinator at uh, the Jesuit Center for Ecology and Development in Malawi. Uh, our responsibilities include performing climate justice research and policy analysis, uh, lobbying for pro poor policies and bold climate actions, and increasing awareness and sharing information about the situation. Uh, Martha is deeply committed to empowering and amplifying the vo voices of the most vulnerable uh, poor populations, which are frequently left out of development efforts. We are very delighted to have her uh, with us today and eagerly awaits uh, our views. Um, in response to uh, the reports uh, that is highlighted uh, uh, on the importance of drastically reducing uh, greenhouse gas emission to achieve climate targets. Uh, Martha, what role uh, do you think uh, individual behavior change, such as reducing meat consumption or using public transport can play in reducing uh, emissions? And what else do you think uh, is essential to include in the social political life? Over to you, Martha. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm so delighted to be part, to be part of this platform. Uh, this is a very good conversation. But before I go straight to my, I think, questions, I'll just give, uh, I would like to concur with the first speaker on the findings of the latest IPCC report. As the IPCC report has highlighted some losses and damages that they will keep on uh, affecting the least developed and vulnerable countries. In this case, we are talking about Africa and least developed countries. We should end up creating more poverty. I just want to share the experience that we are currently having here in Malawi. So I work with Jesuit Center for Ecology and Development. And as JCD Malawi, we are already witness, uh, witnessing actually the impact of climate change on the vulnerable farmers that you are working with uh, in rural areas of Malawi. 
most of our farmers are losing their crops and livelihoods uh, due to intensifying and increased frequency of climate shocks, such as droughts, uh, prolonged dry spells, you talk of floods and cyclones. And this is actually posing a serious threat to uh, the food security, you know, uh, even issues of healthy economic development to the rural communities, which is again pushing them further into poverty. So just this month, uh, just this month, two weeks ago, Malawi was hit hard by Cyclone Friday, which um, as of yesterday, the, 20th, uh, the 30th of March, 2023, the Cyclone Friday has affected over 2.3 million people with about 577 camps set just to accommodate the displaced people. As we are talking now, the death toll is at 676 with about over 1,700 people who have been reported injured. So what does this all mean? Or why am I giving all this background? I really just want to concur with what the IPCC report is highlighting that we are currently at around 1.1 degrees Celsius of, uh, of global warming and uh, current climate policies are projected to increase global warming by 3.2 degrees Celsius by 2100. Now, what, what do we really need to do? What needs to happen now, more especially in these least developed countries where the most marginalized people, those who contribute less are mostly affected? I think the solutions are out there to reduce emissions by at least 43 degrees Celsius over the next seven years, as the IPCC report is highlighting. And the same report is highlighting that to achieve this, we need to transition from the fossil fuels without carbon capture and storage to very low or zero carbon energy sources such as renewable or fossil fuels with uh, carbon capture with storage. Now, personally, I was reflecting and, and, and I feel like the importance of uh, individual actions is often, I think, overlooked in the climate conversation, more especially in African countries, more especially in the least developed countries. We normally point the fingers at global North countries, large companies and governments to make changes, often falling back to the argument that there is no point in us changing until they do. It seems that we have. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, it looks like we have lost her. Our microphone just uh, muted. And uh, she had mentioned earlier she's um, at the hospital and having some challenges. I think uh, at this uh, moment, um, we will open uh, in the meantime the QA session and address the, some of the audience queries uh, to, um, to, to, to Neil for, for, for the moment, uh, since uh, Martha. Um, has lost uh, connection for the moment. Actually, she was just talking about the question of phasing out fossil fuel. And uh, one of uh, uh, the participants highlighted that uh, you see in some least developed uh, countries that uh, there are new projects uh, underway to start the extracting fossil fuel and start processing. Uh, what uh, do you think, uh, Mr. Nile, could be done in such a situation, especially in those uh, least developed countries? Martha had alluded into it a little bit, phasing fossil fuel and to bring in carbon capture. What would you like to add on top of that? I mean, I think that, that <clears throat> so I think for, for countries such as Uganda who are looking to exploit their fossil fuels, you can uh, understand economically why a country might wish to do that. I think there are lots of myths going around about the fact of uh, if you are going to help the energy transition, you need fossil fuels, or if you are going to help the poorest, then you need fossil fuels. So if, you, if you're if you gonna help poor communities to access energy, 
you need fossil fuels. Now that we know that's not the case because we know actually if you provide renewables, it's quicker, it's cheaper, it's more sustainable, and it gives, for example, electricity into poor communities much, much cheaper and much easier than any kind of fossil fuels will do. So I and I think also they are being governments are being uh, pushed to exploit their fossil fuels by big uh, fossil fuel companies in the north as well. So I think the 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 push needs to come from both. So I think we need to a really uh, support all those voices who are pushing back on fossil fuels in countries like Uganda, but also we in the north need to be making sure that those that the taxes for those fossil fuel companies are such that they actually adequately reflect the impact that those fossil fuel companies are having happening are having sorry on our environment the secretary general the un secretary general calls on a global tax on energy companies and i think that's that's a really important thing for to happen because actually it's only when you start taxing that those companies will and really start pushing them economically that those gov those companies will change their their policies don't know if that helps. Thank you, uh, Mr. Neil. Uh, there is another question uh, which uh, relates to earlier. We talked about uh, adaptation options becoming less effective. So uh, there is a question a question in the chat uh, that's asking whether um, climate adaptation efforts uh, could still be helpful uh, in reaching uh, 1.5 degrees C's in comparison to climate mitigation. Absolutely. I, I, and I, as, I, as I said, I think that the trouble is we're, we're fast, as people say, we're last, fast moving away from a, an adaptation scenario and into a loss and damage scenario. But I think adaptation funding is way below what it should be. It's way below what funding goes to mitigation. And adaptation funding really needs that kind of grant based funding, because a lot of the other funding can be sourced from maybe other other sources which aren't publicly don't don't come from the public purse but adaptation funding because there's no real investment potential in it really needs to come from grants not loans and not anything else and that's where it's critical for us to put more money into adaptation funding now but also into the loss and damage as we as we increasingly move away from adaptation and unfortunately into into a loss and damage space i Thank see that Thank you. Um, I, I think Martha is back. Maybe we can give her a moment to uh, to conclude. But also, Martha, maybe you can try to respond to some of this question. The question of fossil fuel, I think one of our next speaker will uh, still address this as well. So uh, maybe let's save a little more for, for later. So Martha, if you're back, please, you may conclude uh, your, your, your sharing. All right. Uh, thank you so much. And apologies for the poor network. Uh, my point, I'll just go straight to finalize everything. I was trying to communicate to share that um, the importance of individual actions is normally overlooked in the climate conversation, more especially for developing countries, African countries. So we normally tend to point fingers at the global north countries, uh, the large companies and the government to make changes, uh, uh, often failing back on the argument that there is no point in us changing and do they do but however this is not true while we increase action at that global level i think as individuals it is very fundamental that change are uh, the changes to individual behavior can actually induce them so i will just share some of the um uh, individual behaviors that i feel uh, that I've, uh, I, I i feel are so relevant in this case as, the, as per the latest uh, IPCC assessment report, which just came out, it has actually highlighted issues of, you know, um, shifting from the fossil fuels without uh, carbon capture and storage to very low or zero carbon energy sources, such as renewable or fossil fuels with the carbon capture storage. Now, the relevance to this change is the realization that most of the greenhouse emissions that are out there comes from the household or our lifestyle consumption. Our lifestyle consumption, including even mobility, as well as diet and housing globally, as opposed to what we think in terms of uh, government or capital or infrastructure investments. 
So my contribution is to say, in terms of public transport, I think we should really promote the use of public transport because we know the public transport helps to reduce emissions. Basically, the limit, uh, they limit the flow of personal vehicles. Uh, we should definitely reduce the carbon footprint. We all know that in African countries, many people love to drive. Everyone would like to would like to drive to drive to let's say his workplace. But it's actually good. I think it's a high time that we start taking these personal actions in, in in calling for agent action for climate change that is actually happening now. So I think we can lead I think we we lost math again, but at least she was uh, on the point of concluding uh, uh, our sharing. I just um, would suggest that uh, Martha, when you are back, there is a question I wanted to pose to you regarding uh, um, the production of agricultural uh, livestock, uh, especially in Africa. Maybe you can prepare in your concluding remarks later, you can respond uh, to that question. Uh, to Mr. Neil as well. Uh, uh, you can look out some of the questions in your concluded remark later. You can uh, uh, still uh, give uh, your views on that. So I would like to thank uh, every one of you uh, who have spoken on our first panel and um, uh, you have given your perspective on what we are seeing. So now uh, let us uh, proceed to our second panel discussion, uh, which will review the steps uh, being uh, being taken, or uh, what should be be done to achieve the climate targets. And I would uh, like to welcome and introduce the Mr. Adita John Rodriguez uh, from Bangladesh, um, who will be discussing the youth perspective on climate change. And as we all know, young people uh, they always say we are leaders of tomorrow, but we are guardians of the future. And uh, Adita is a member of the Bangladesh Catholic Students Movement and also an, uh, a commission member for the IMCS Asia Pacific Commission for Laudato uh, Si. And uh, we are delighted to have uh, Adita with us today to offer his thoughts on how young people may help to address the climate uh, crisis. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez, can you share with us um, uh, how uh, young people see governments and other stakeholders acting to ensure a healthy future climate for all and uh, tell us if you think that it is enough or what in particular would you would like them to do but also feel free to share with us what you are doing to come to doing to contribute to climate justice as a young person but also in your group as young people thank you over to you Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really honored to be a part of this discussion today. So hello, everyone. I'm Aditya John Rodriguez from Bangladesh. So I'm nothing much but just a student. I have been working with the Laudato Si Commission of IMCS in the Asia Pacific region. And I'm a member of Bangladesh Catholic Students Movement, which is a movement recognized by IMCS of 1,500 members in all over the, all over the country. So I'm not that much of an expert or an experienced guy to talk about this issue of climate change. And when I was looking after the panel of speakers today, I felt like that I really don't belong here. I really don't know anything comparing to them. I don't even have the educational background regarding this. So I was really nervous that what I should talk about here. So even a few minutes back, a few hours back when I was, I was preparing for my sharing, by the way, I took a huge preparation for the sharing because I'm really new to this. So if I make any mistakes, Please correct me. I really love. I would really love it. So, I came up with a plan that I will try to share my perspective as a youth, as a student, and as a very ordinary young guy from a very small nation. So, I will try to share my own realization, my thoughts about how the youths and I myself can participate in the betterment of the Mother Earth. Uh, in my sharing, there will be no statistics, no scientific explanations, or any survey results but I will just share some real life stories and thoughts. So I'm pretty much sure that all of us here have seen a lot of blogs, articles, documentaries, or maybe short films. In fact, there are tons of award winning short films about the issue of climate change, right? So we have seen a lot of this. Uh, in fact, these films, documentaries, or articles really make us aware of the whole situation or the future of this planet. But we won't really realize that how destructive the nature is getting day by day sitting at our own apartment or house until we get to experience this on our own. 
for example, me as a youth or my friends uh, having an urban lifestyle, we are very much aware of the climate changes. We are starting it from our schools and colleges. We are watching documentaries, films, blogs, etc. We all know that calamities are happening every year now and then. But still, we are enjoying our day on an air-conditioned apartment, private vehicles. We are doing our shopping from the shopping malls. When it rains, we chill out in the weather. A sudden thunderstorm or, or a hailstorm is not a concerning issue for us. Uh, when it rains, we maybe take a cup of tea or a guitar to chill out in the weather. So, but at the same time, on a different part of the world, or maybe in a different part of our country, some people are dying. They're losing their houses. They're losing the lands. They're losing their crop fields. Uh, for example, if I give the example of my country, Bangladesh, uh, we sometimes say that Bangladesh is a very lucky country because it's full of rivers. Uh, it's one of the largest delta in the world. But these rivers become a monster during the monsoon. It takes away the houses of thousands of people every year, kills a lot of people, destroys the crop fields. Or maybe on a, all of a sudden, a hailstorm in a very odd timing of the year can destroy the crops. Bangladesh being an agriculturally dependent country, it's a huge damage for the poor farmer of our country. So we are not actually experiencing the destructive form of the nature, but they are, because they know how bad it can be. So I would like to request all the youths and the students like me that don't just read articles, don't just watch documentaries, don't just watch short films, but try to realize it from your own. Try to realize that the climate is changing. I'm sure if you guys try to think, everybody will get something which will be a visible example of climate change of your own life. Maybe it will not be as big or as destructive as I mentioned earlier, but it will surely have an indication, indication that the climate is changing. For example, from my own realization, uh, when I was a kid, uh, this example may seem very funny to you guys, but uh, this is how I realized. So for example, from my own realization that when I was a kid of maybe four to five years old, uh, during the Christmas, we used to attend the Holy Mass in the morning, but every year we had to wait at least a few hours for the weather to get normal because it was so foggy that we can't even see ourselves. But it was a very common thing during that time. But now after 15 to 16 years, the 25th December winter morning is just a normal ordinary day in our country. It may be the temperature is a bit low, otherwise we wouldn't have called it a winter season, but everything else is very normal. Uh, even if we see a bit of a fog, then we get surprised because it's a very abnormal case nowadays. So this kind of things will make you realize that it's changing and it's high time for us to take, for, to take necessary steps and come forward. So I want to give this message and I want to request all the youths who are listening today that start thinking with your own stories and real life experiences and then try to figure out what's happening all over the world and who are responsible for this and why. This self-realization can help us to take bigger initiatives and bigger changes. A movie, a documentary or article will surely make us aware of it, but the self-realization will make more sense to us. So besides this, I want to really talk about something else. Uh, I have already shared about it a bit that I've said that we don't understand what's happening on a different part of the country sitting at our air conditioned apartment. But those who are losing the lands, losing the families are experiencing it with their own life. But if I ask, are they responsible for it? Definitely not. It's me who is sitting on an air conditioned apartment it's me who is using an air-conditioned vehicle, shopping malls, creating roads, highways, industries, factories, by destroying water lands and forests. We are enjoying the urbanization, but someone else is paying for it. We are not worried about it at all because the temperature is not an issue for us. We have our own artificial solution for it. Because a polluted water body is not an issue for us. We have an advanced water purifying technology for it. So why it should bother us, right? but this is where we must change. Otherwise doing awareness rallies, planting some trees, creating awareness campaigns will not bring any change until we change our thinking. We have to first change the way we think. If we can make ourselves realize that no one else should pay for our mistake, or we should not do something which will make someone else pay for it, from that day, we will take our first step to change the world. So this is maybe a very small perception that I'm talking about. But if we think from a global perception, the same thing is happening. Developed countries are making eco-friendly policies, successfully preserving the environment. 
But on the other hand, the countries which are not yet developed uh, or trying to be developed is continuously destroying the nature for their economic development. Um, I'm not an expert, so I will maybe I will be wrong with some of my examples. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I will give example of my country since this is what I have, I have seen. I have not that much experience with in this field. So in my country, uh, there is a power station, a power plant being built in the middle of the world's largest mangrove forest, the Shundarbon. It's an UNESCO World Heritage Site. How huge is this, right? A power plant or a power station inside a mangrove forest. So why it's being built out there? Obviously, obviously there is a reason because there is a necessity for it. Uh, many, many mega constructions are going all over the country. So a power station like this is very necessary. In fact, a few years back, uh, when we had to worry about electricity all day long because in the 24 hours day, we, we don't have any electricity at our home for almost 10 to 12 hours. Even still, it's a problem, but it's decreasing day by day. So this is a necessity. So if we, but while making this plan, it was not considered that it will totally affect the mangrove forest. So we can say that competing with the world economy, it's forcing countries like Bangladesh to take this kind of drastic steps. Uh, another example, if I get, give again from my country, Bangladesh, Bangladesh has the largest ship recycling industry all over the world. Almost 30 to 40% ship recycling happens in my country. There are almost 200 active shipyards, ship breaking yards in Bangladesh. Is it bad? Yes, it's really very bad because due to ship breaking, harmful substances like persistent organic pollutants, heavy metals become wide open in the environment, which is a huge threat to the habitants. So isn't the government aware of it? Yeah, I believe they're really aware of it because it's a huge issue. But again, competing with the world economy, countries like Bangladesh is being forced to have such industries and take such steps. So I gave this example to make you guys understand that what I'm trying to say, but for now, let's forget it and think that what we are doing. And we have to realize that what we are doing, someone else should not pay for it. So for me, to participate in the betterment of the mother earth, firstly, we have to make ourselves realize with our own stories that how much important this issue is, and then promise ourselves that we won't do anything for which someone else will have to pay. If we can bring this change in ourselves, then we will be able to make ourselves aware of our others aware of it also. It's not possible for us here, by us, I mean the students or the youths. Here, it's not possible for us to change the government policies or the system. But what we can do is that we can convert our generation to an example. We can be an example to the whole world. We can be an example to the government. We can be an example to the mass people that how we can bring changes together. If we become an example, then the government will be seeing us. And that's where I think as a youth, we can bring the first change. And for this, I believe I, I tried to answer the questions you uh, asked me, but maybe I had some lackings because I'm not that much expert in this field. So thank you for, very much for giving me this opportunity. I tried to share my thoughts about this. And thank, thank you very you. much for listening to me. Thank you for presenting the voice uh, of the, the young people, but also you identified very important role in our lifestyle. Whatever we do as we live our life would be enjoyment on our side and comfort, but somebody is paying for it uh, directly through the, the consequences uh, in terms of uh, their livelihood due to uh, climate change. Thank you. I think uh, take your time. There are some questions coming through through the chat. We shall have a moment. You will get back to respond and maybe you can share more uh, some of your thoughts so i will now um welcome mariana uh royal i think she's joined us she's with us now an uh, expert she's an expert in environmental science and renewable energy and she's from argentina um she is uh, the coordinator of the Latin America Network for Justice and Peace uh, training, and she's also a member of the Bishop's Conference Justice and Peace Commission. Uh, Mariana is also an environmental science lecturer at the Pontifical Catholic University of Buenos Aires. Uh, we are honored to have you here with us today to offer uh, your expertise and knowledge on energy transition. And uh, uh, Royal, can you... Uh, uh, tell us how countries with uh, less developed economies 
can balance economic growth, social prosperity, uh, and sustainability while meeting uh, the climate targets. And also, as renewable energies relates to just transition, how do you uh, think changes in the energy metrics should be done to achieve an equitable and fair transition? Uh, over to you, uh, Mariana. Thank you, and good afternoon for all of you. Thank you for being here uh, those minutes uh, to listen and think together. Uh, very interesting questions, innocent, balance economic growth, social prosperity and sustainability is the only possible way. First of all, uh, countries should know that they are not opposite goals at pollution and pollution is not an option. They have to analyze their reality, their adverse situations and their opportunities. They are opportunities. This knowledge must be not only qualitative, it has to be also quantitative. As a result of measurements, we have to take a, a date, date. And from there, planning actions in the short, medium and long term. There are countless improvements that can be made simply through reorganization and redistribution of existing resources that is without measured economic expenses. That's where the countries have to start. The key point is to understand that environmental impacts carries costs to countries. These costs are, are not visible and are not considered in business analysis. But I assure you that if we start including environmental costs in project business cases, we would be able to focus on being more efficient and we would achieve many measurable savings also in economic terms. We could save research, uh, resources such as water, energy, and savings in health costs because we would be attending to the cost of many dishes and saving money too. Even though after efficiency actions, we all will need financial help. And as an example, I will, I will talk to you uh, about renewable energies, renewable energies, that they are coming to help us in all of this for a just transition. So why do we talk about energy transition? Because the main source of greenhouse gas emissions is energy activity. So it needs to be modified. The last IPCC report show us the effects of the climate change, the urgency on work on it, adaptation and mitigation. Today, I want to invite you to think about this. Pope Francisco in Laudato Si says, it has become urgent and imperative to develop policies so that in the coming years, the emissions of carbon dioxide and other high pollution, pollution gases is drastically reduced. For example, by replacing the use of fossil fuels and developing renewable energy sources. So what can we do and how can we do that? Well, we need to take action with both individual and class actions, do our best effort. From individual actions, we can generate the contagion effect in addition to our own contribution. From collective community actions, we will achieve better results. I'm including here from small communities up to the countries and all of them together. So how should be these individual and collective actions? They should be in this order. First of all, think about the need of your consumption. Is it really needed? Second, think about the magnitude of this need. Do you really need to use it in that way? Can you prescind of any of it? And third, think about the technology that you are using. Could you replace any of it? Think about your electrodomestics in your process equipment, transport, etc. And after all, think about the source of the energy that you are using. Do you know how is it produced? Is it renewable or fossil? All this leads us to conclude that we need to adopt new habits 
and new ways to produce our products and services. We have to adopt new ways of consumption. It's a challenge for all of us. Because in addition, these changes have to occur within the framework of a just transition. This, mean, this means that we have to work together, including the most vulnerable people, and rethink new models, integral human models. In this way, renewable energies are an opportunity. Some examples here, hydroelectric energy in a micro scale because in a, it, a micro scale is the scale that minimizes environmental impacts for the activity. It should be less than 50 horsepower. Another examples are solar energy and wind energy, the most famous. Biomass dendro energy, who use organic compounds and waste. Geothermal energy, who uses the difference of temperature between the surface and soil, etc. So we have to think about diversifying energy matrices with different models, not only the typical solar park or wind park, host, who are very important too, but they, are, they aren't the only way. Exit different scales. The generation could be on grid or off grid, and we also can produce our own energy. That's a great opportunity. And there are more benefits. Of course, we would, uh, first of the, of the benefits is the reduction of greenhouse gases emissions, but also we could access to energy in locations of grid so we could overcome the isolation of communities. Also, we could create new shops opportunities thanks of the geographical diversification of sources of energy. And in the same way, we could generate new knowledge. We say that better results are obtained by working as a team in community. So it's possible to think in communities with self-sufficiency of energy, communities growing integrally. What do we need to achieve it? What needs to be done? And Francisco saying Laudato Si, there is a low level of access to clean and renewable energy in the world. So we need listening to each other and working together, create opportunities, decision and actions. Let's do it. I invite you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mariana, for being uh, very uh, straight and straight to the point and on, uh, on time. You highlighted and invited us to reflect on the products and services that we use in our day-to-day -day life, how they produce, what uh, amount of emissions in the production, and to also reflect whether we need to replace or repair or reuse whatever we have. And also you uh, highlighted uh, the, actually, I like the way you put it, renewable energy as an opportunity. Everyone living on this planet is out there looking for opportunity. And each time we miss an opportunity, we regret for a very long time. So if we look at renewable energy with all the benefits that you highlighted, I think we will do better in terms of uh, limiting uh, the rise in the temperature of global warming, but also achieving the net uh, zero uh, greenhouse gas emission. Now I will uh, welcome our next uh, speaker, uh, Claudia Campero. Uh, Claudia uh, is the partnership coordinator of uh, Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. And um, Claudia has a strong academic background, having studied geography at uh, Universidad Nacional Autonoma de Mexico and uh, completing a master's at the University College of London. Uh, Claudia is an environmental uh, justice campaigner with over 15 years uh, of uh, experience working with NGOs and grassroots organizations. She has previously worked with the Council of Canadians and also with Food and Water Watch. Uh, she also worked with the Greenpeace uh, Mexico, and uh, she is a member of the Alianza Mexicana contra el fracking. Uh, we are eagerly uh, waiting uh, Claudia's thoughts on uh, these critical issues uh, of environmental sustainability. 
and uh, therefore Mr. Kampero, uh, what do you believe are the most uh, significant uh, challenges facing international community in meeting the goals set out in the AR6 uh, sentences report and what solutions uh, can be implemented uh, to overcome uh, these challenges? And do you think that we are making real progress at climate summits like, uh, for instance, the last COP27? And what else do you think can we do to speed up the fossil fuel uh, phase out towards uh, an energy transition? Thank you, over to you. Thank you so much, Innocent. And thank you so much for the invitation to speak to you today. Um, so one of the most important messages of the IPCC report is 1.5 degrees is still within reach. So the world has warmed already 1.1 degree and is quickly warming, still warming up. Uh, and we know that any increase in global temperature means uh, hardship for the planet and for the people of the planet. And as has been said previously, it's greater hardship to those that are least responsible about this temperature increase. So in order for to stay in 1.5 degrees, to not keep increasing after 2100, 2100 we must make enormous changes to stop this temperature rise. Um, and the IPCC reaffirms the urgency to phase out fossil fuels to tackle this climate emergency. Um, it requires immediate and rapid action, ending this dependency on coal, oil, and gas, all three of them. To avoid the worst scenarios, we need to leave fossil fuels. So. What are the challenges? The challenges are mainly political and related to the power the industry holds in politics. We need the political will to change the business as usual. And something that's really important is mitigation is a must. So stopping this dependency on fossil fuels is non-negotiable because then what the report explains is adaptation will become more and more difficult if we keep uh, sending emissions to our atmosphere. So we need both. We need to stop our dependency on fossil fuels and we need the adaptation. But if we don't stop the dependency on fossil fuels, adaptation will be more and more difficult. So the COPs have not delivered because they have been hostage to the laggards, the countries that do not want to change. We need international cooperation, co cooperation to fix this problem, but we need real climate leaders, not these climate leaders that say that they're doing something while they're approving more projects such as the UK, such as the US, such as Australia, many countries of what we call the global north are really just saying that they're doing stuff while they're not actually implementing the changes that we need. And these real climate leaders exist and they are responsible of us talking about 1.5 degrees and not two degrees. When the Paris Agreement was being drafted, the Pacific Island nations pushed for this 1.5 uh, target and they managed to get it in a way that it's now what we're all aiming at because we have understood that an increase in two degrees is way more more disastrous than uh, 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 an, an, a 1.5 um, target. So these Pacific nations have actually led the world uh, 
from several years back and just recently got together six Pacific nations, including Vanuatu and Tuvalu, Fiji, Toga, Solomon Islands, and Niue. And they have been very clear in saying these, this language that some countries keep pushing in the cops of unabated or inefficient, trying to qualify fossil fuels are actually loopholes for fossil fuel producers to keep polluting. So they have been very straightforward in the sense of saying, we must call for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, and we must lead on the creation of a global alliance to negotiate this treaty that will govern the end of fossil fuel expansion, will promote an equitable phase out of fossil fuels and a global just transition. So what is this about? This is uh, the initiative that I am very honored to be part of, which is called the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. And it is the aim to have this um, international roadmap that will allow to keep the fossil fuels on the ground, as we know, and as the science tells us, we must. So this um, proposal of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty has three pillars. The very first one is stop expansion, stop making the problem larger, stop exploring for new fossil fuels. Then, and at the same time, we need to start thinking of how we're going to manage an equitable phase out of fossil fuels. And this means that the countries that have polluted the most have to move faster because not only they have already made the problem uh, as big as we're now facing, but they are also in greater capacity to finance and change this uh, faster and really go for the energy transition. But this energy transition must be just. It must consider the, the benefit of communities and workers around the world. And this means, of course, finance from the gold, global north towards the global south. So this idea of the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty has already been endorsed by nearly 300 faith institutions from all over the world, from many different faiths, and from leaders such as Cardinal Chetney. And of course, LSM's leadership in this has been amazing and has uh, really allowed us to reach out to more um, uh, faith institutions and, 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 and people that are moved through faith. Um, also, the European Union uh, Parliament has called for this non-proliferation treaty and also the World Health Organization. So uh, the invitation to you all is that you might want to look, find us um, through our website, the fossilfueltreaty.org website, and you can follow us through social media and endorse the treaty and share the proposal and uh, also support what this Pacific nations are telling us. We must uh, lead the way in a fossil fuel free future. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, so much, Claudia, for, for your thoughts. And uh, you have kind of delved very deep into fossil fuel. Many questions came up earlier. And uh, thank you for addressing uh, some of them uh, in your, your presentation. And uh, uh, it's very important to note the need for political will. Uh, there's no need for business as usual. I think this calls for us to campaign more and lobby more for member states to uh, change the ways business is being done uh, uh, today. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, the actions now, uh, I would like at this point uh, to open again the Q&A to address, uh, I see lots of questions. Uh, from the audience, and uh, some of them are uh, specific uh, to, uh, to, to, to the speakers. Uh, I will try to start with uh, the question, which is uh, around the extraction. 
uh, of other raw materials that are being used in uh, in a way in this um, renewable energy, like you talk about the batteries which are used in electric cars and computers, they still require also uh, use of uh, water, uh, fuel, and some even as far as uh, child labor and all that. What uh, would you comment on this? Especially, I would like to address this uh, first to uh, Mariana and maybe also uh, Claudia, you could respond to this. Uh, feel free. Uh, Claudia, maybe you can go ahead. It looks like uh, Mariana. I'm so sorry. I was looking at other questions and missed oh. the questions. Could you repeat? Okay. Yeah, I was asking in relation to um, the transition uh, to uh, you no know, green energy. For example, the extraction like lithium, cobalt, and all that that is used in the production of batteries for electric cars, computers, and all that. Uh, all this is leading to more and more uh, extraction work, which is even causing more damage and leading more and more to global warming and green, uh, gas to, uh, greenhouse gas emission. What uh, do you think can be done to uh, achieve this uh, without creating even more problems as we transition? Thank you. Thank you. This is a very important question and I'm afraid there's no easy answer to it. Um, we must push for the transition that we need to do to be just. And um, this means that when mining is required, it, it, it needs to be in a way that does not harm the communities, which is something that is not currently happening. Um, so one of the things that we must achieve is the fairness. And in any case, any scenario does say we need to reduce our energy consumption. And when we talk about reducing our energy consumption, we are mostly talking about those who have a, a very large energy consumption, which is, again, the global north and the rich in the global south. So these are changes that must be done in order for the um, uh, transition to actually be just, because um, everybody having an electric car will not be possible. We don't have um, enough um, enough uh, resources for that to happen. We have mentioned around public transportation, around walking, around cycling. There's a lot that needs to be done at uh, city level. Agriculture needs to change as well. You, uh, people must know that a lot of uh, the current agriculture, industrial agriculture, is dependent on fossil fuels for the um, fertilizers and for transporting massive amounts of food around the world. So it needs to be much, far more localized. Um, so these are all um, solutions that are also uh, need to be decentralized. And we have to change many rules for this to happen and uh, stop the madness of transporting products all around the world. Um, we are consuming things that come from very, very far away while we can still uh, find them and, and, and use them within our countries. Uh, thank you, uh, Claudia. Uh, now I would like to address this question to Adita. Uh, the question regarding the lifestyle, uh, uh, what do you think can be done to this, uh, you know, to have the destructive lifestyle for example when you talk about uh, the installation of a, an, a power plant inside the rainforest something like that you see in local communities uh, people cutting trees some is the only source of firewood they have to cook the food and some do burn charcoal uh, is a sort of a business but also for livelihood what do you think can be done to curve this kind of lifestyle or what it can be done to transition this kind of lifestyle to ensure that also the livelihood of the communities is in a way, not kind of uh, carved away, and then they are left with nothing to survive on. 
Adita, uh, over to you. And Nile, also, if you can add uh, your voice to this, Neil, it would be great. And also, Neil, you can maybe respond to a question which is ask, what can NGOs do like us in terms of actions, like concrete actions, but also advocacy? And how can we mobilize resources to facilitate some of those actions? Yes, yeah, so Adita first, and then uh, Neil, you can come in. Sorry, I always call you Nile because I have a, uh, I'm from the source of the Nile in Uganda. <laughs> okay, um, thank you for giving me a chance. I don't know how much I will be able to add with this point. Uh, I think Mr. Nail will be able to say more about this. Uh, as a youth, I don't. Uh, I think the youths are the face of the country, the face of the generation, or the face of the nation. So, as a youth, what we can do from our place is that we can highlight these situations, these problems, to the local communities, to the government, to the uh, virtual world, or to the mass media, that these problems are happening and these are some concerning issues that we, we focus, we should focus. So that's where the youths can contribute uh, in our daily life. So we have to take collaborative actions. We have to take uh, collective actions to come together and make uh, spread the message throughout the world so that NGOs, big NGOs can take necessary steps. The governments get more awareness about the situation. So that's how the youths can contribute in this kind of problem. Thank you, Adita. Over to you, Neil. May if I if I can start with the second question about how do NGOs get involved? Yeah. I mean, it depends on which NGO you're talking about and where 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 they are, obviously. But I think the important thing, as as um, Claudia mentioned earlier, this whole whole point about just transition. You know, it's easy to pick out these specific things, whether it's about charcoal, whether it's about mining, whether it's about if you step back and go, actually, how are you going to have a transition which creates, you know, jobs which are, you know, helpful, you know, which have are supportive for the poorest, which, you know, promote, you know, which are good for the planet and good for the nature and tackle poverty. That's the starting point, <clears throat> you know, and we know that there needs to be a big transition in the north because actually we need to get away from private car use. We need to get much more into public transport. We need to get stopped flying everywhere. So it's a kind of big picture, um, but I think we need to step back and actually start changing the economy. And that's the that's the important thing with all of these things. So if you take charcoal burning, well, actually, where well, you need to think about the fact of why they're doing it in the first place, because probably people don't have energy. And actually, the best way of promoting energy is green, you know, actually sustainable, renewable pieces. And that means climate finance. And that means coming back from the north. So it's a never ending kind of cycle of potentially of problems but also if you think about it in the other way then actually there are real opportunities to change our economies and which support the health of people which support better lifestyles which get us more active we know that you know in the UK, in UK and US and others obesity and other diseases are actually huge and that's coming that's being translated across into other countries so we need that shift. We need that shift, which Pope Francis talks to us about, actually, of a just transition, but that whole economy changing. So I think NGOs need to advocate for those, especially the Catholic NGOs, because we have a great leader in Pope Francis enabling us to do that. I hope that answers the question sufficiently. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Uh, Martha, I don't know if uh, you're, you're back, you want to, you want to add uh, something on this because you raised um, through your engagement in research with local communities in terms of their livelihood. Would you like to add something on this question? Hello, I think I missed the question. May you just come again with the question? Okay, uh, the question is how can uh, or what can be done to curb uh, destructive lifestyles, uh, especially in terms of the local livelihood, for example, you think about the, the mama in the local community somewhere who cuts down tree for firewood uh, to, to, to be able to feed. Uh, what do you think can be done as we are talking about uh, just transition to transition um, in a way that it does not um, it kind of get rid of the livelihood of some of the poorest who are actually affected most by uh, this uh, climate uh, change crisis. All right, uh, thank you so much. So first of all, start by saying, I think we need more sensitization. Uh, these people need to be sensitized on the importance of, you know, uh, using uh, the importance of just transition. 
before I talk about just transition, I was actually, I think I typed something to do with the car pulling, you know. These are some of the things that we, in Africa, African countries, we prioritize and we think it's a very good lifestyle to drive, like each and every person driving to work. But at the end of the day, we don't really see the emissions which are being, uh, which are being produced out of that. So I think... Uh, the, the whole point is that people really don't understand. They feel like it's it's a good lifestyle to do it that way. And like this other way of, let's say, car pulling, like maybe joining with your two or three friends, going to work together, or maybe um, knowing the importance of, you know, they just transitioning, the use of the more uh, eco-friendly, uh, let's say, cookstoves and all that. So I think the the the, the, more, the main issue here is more of sensitizing these local communities to understand the importance of this. Thank you so much. I don't know if I've tackled the question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I, we are a little bit running be, behind schedule. There are so many questions. I think the one hour we had planned for today uh, is not enough, but this is a beginning of conversations. We will be providing... Um, uh, more links and more information later by emails it's good all of you to registered so that we can carry on the conversations even on youtube the recording will be available and it will be uploaded on the laudato C movement youtube channel and the link will be made available to you but you can also just search and like the the page on youtube so whenever the, it's uploaded you get a notification there is a point that has been raised uh, in the q a about the the importance of photography uh, like a campaign uh, in terms of addressing uh, the effects of climate change but also educating young people and i like this idea very much that has been laid by, raised by collins from uh, zanzibar where they're working with young people uh, in the laudato sea journey by helping them in terms of uh, photography capturing uh, the story about uh, what is being happening to our environment in the inspiration of uh, laudato sea which is something that very much is in line with the theme of uh, this year's laudato sea week around um, the, the, the promotion of the documentary, uh, the later uh, film documentary. And I think it's something that maybe uh, in Zambia, you can also try to find a way to um, screen uh, this video, share with the young people uh, in your country, all around the world, you can uh, take uh, time to go through this. And I think, like I said, in the interest of time, as we conclude, uh, um, uh, this uh, 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 Q&A, I don't know, Mariana, if you are back. And um, as the panelist uh, discussions come to close, I would like to thank uh, all of our guest speakers and ask them uh, in a form of a conclusion now, what actions they believe are required uh, for the upcoming COP28 uh, climate summit to achieve the goal of limiting the temperature increases to 1.5 degrees C and also reducing net greenhouse gas emission to zero as soon as possible. Uh, this goal uh, has been advocated for, as we all know, by His Holiness Pope Francis, and is shared by many uh, member states or many nations around the world. Uh, what uh, is some of the suggestions on how we may collaborate to achieve this goal? I will give one minute to each uh, of the speaker. If I can start with Mariana, I think we lost at one point. Please um, go ahead. You are still muted. Unmute yourself, please. Thank you. Yes, as a resume, I think that we have to think uh, about all the all the activities we have, and we have uh, a very important role, a very important uh, action to do. I'm sorry about about my my English. It's very. <laughs> Yeah. Very poor, but we have to choose uh, keeping in mind uh, the minimum the minimum environmental impact in our activities. We have to to think uh, the diversity of the opportunities that we have. Uh, renewable energy is one option, is one of the opportunities that we have. Um, and thinking beyond simple models. I invite you to, to think about the diversity of opportunities and we have to, to work together. I think that uh, that's a, a very important thing. And thank you uh, very much, uh, Mariana. I will give the floor next to Adita. Please give us your final words. 
um, I would say the same as Mariana, that we have to come together uh, to bring changes. Well, I think many initiatives are being taken for the global climate change issue. So more has to be taken. It, we have to take more aggressive measures, maybe uh, greater global cooperation to mitigate this impact of climate change. So we have to come together or we have to uh, hold our hands together to bring the change. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Adita, for being very precise and concise. Martha, Piri, over to you. Uh, final thoughts? I think it's just as what my fellow panelists, the speakers have just said, I think partnership is key when we are to achieve or in terms of any plan list, more especially in such issues of global issues, climate crisis. We can all fight this together. We can't do it individually. So I will still go by the same uh, weight of partnerships. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Martha. Um, Claudia, over to you, your final words. trying to unmute myself. <laughs> um, well, while our individual lifestyle choices are important, uh, we must also use our political voice. We must push our governments to do the right thing. We must stop our fossil fuel dependence and ensure a just transition for all. And we heartily invite you to endorse the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty which you can do as an individual, as an organization, and uh, support the movement for this call. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now over to you, Neil, your final words. Um, just heartily agree on the Fossil Fuel Treaty. CAFOD has uh, signed it, so I would encourage others to also do it. I, I would bring it back to the climate talks. I, I would say two things. We are going to be in Dubai uh, this year. So I would say that we need very concrete action on phasing out of fossil fuels. As the Holy See delegation, we pushed that last year, as did many other countries. So we want to push that again this year, especially in a state which is uh, dependent on fossil fuels. That's going to be a tough ask. And I think the second thing is we need to make sure that that money starts to go into those loss and damage funds, because that's going to be critical in terms of so kind of do whatever you can to engage your governments on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Neil. I think uh, at this time, can I request each of the panelists uh, just to open your cameras and we will have a photo. And uh, Father Eduardo, if you can do with the, the attendees as well, uh, just uh, for the record, um, uh, Mariana, please, if you can turn on and Father Eduardo, Victor, please. Uh, good. Uh, Father Eduardo, if you could turn on. Wonderful. Father Eduardo, I'm still waiting for you. <laughs> Great. Uh, all right. Nice. 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 Okay. 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 I now would like to uh, thank everyone of our distinguished uh, guest speakers for taking time to share their unique thoughts with us uh, during this webinar, but also uh, the in the audience, the participants for your inputs, for your questions. Uh, I would like uh, uh, to thank you also in the audience for your presence and active participation uh, in making this event a success. I think this uh, event today has opened us our high to say we really need to discuss and come together more and more as different Catholic actors, but also NGOs and human beings as uh, Pope Francis invites us living on this planet to work together. Now I would like to pass the floor and welcome the committee that is in charge of crafting the joint statement created by the co-organizers of this webinar in response to the AR6 sentences report. We are honored to have you here and we look forward to hearing uh, from you on the statement's important themes and uh, highlights. Uh, Gina, you are most welcome. Yes, thank you, Innocent. And my name is Gina Castillo and I work for Catholic Relief Services. I lead our climate policy work. I was one of the members that participated in drafting a statement. I will not read this statement. Innocent, if you can put it on the chat so people can have uh, can read it after this. Uh, we would like you to endorse it. Briefly, I wanna just highlight um, the, the areas that we really wanted to emphasize. And I think they align perfectly with what every speaker has communicated this morning. 
for this afternoon. The first point is around faith and science. Uh, there's a convergence. Uh, we start with a beautiful uh, paragraph from La Laudato Si on the need for conversion. The IPCC synthesis report talks about values, worldviews. So there's an alignment between our faith and science. The second important point is the point of injustice around the climate situation. We know that those who have done the least are impacted the most. So every speaker I think has highlighted, has highlighted this gross injustice. The third point that we try to make is that we're somehow in a very privileged position because never before do we have so much knowledge about a problem and so many solutions. Mariana highlighted the opportunities that renew renewables can offer. Claudia highlighted the importance of real climate leadership. We know what we need to do. Fossil, phase out, fossil fuel phase out, green energy transition, the need for more climate finance, the need to actually address the losses and damages that communities are already facing, and things that Neil highlighted. Scenarios can change, they're a possibility. That, so all these things are within our reach. Finally, we wanted to highlight that as Catholic actors, we have our political voice that we can use, we can galvanize action to address those injustices and really to care for this earth, our common home. So we hope that you read the statement, endorse it, and I thank everyone who worked with me on the statement and over to you, Innocent. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Gina. And uh, I now uh, turn the floor over to uh, our distinguished chair, uh, Father Eduardo Agosta, who has worked very tirelessly to keep us up every now and then to put this together. He will offer his final words and uh, officially end our session. Uh, it has been uh, an incredible pleasure for uh, me uh, moderating this event. And I would like to thank all of you uh, uh, for your attendance and the co-organizers for entrusting me um, with this task. I'm very grateful and thank you again. And uh, may God uh, bless you all. Father Eduardo, over to you. Uh, Father Eduardo, you're muted. Uh, can you unmute yourself, please? Thank you. Yes. Is it okay now? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. yes. Thank you, Innocent, for your marvelous work as a moderator. Well, in closing, I have nothing but words of thanks for every of the speakers. Dr. Matilde Rusticucci, a close friend of mine, Neil Thorns, Mariana Roel, Claudia Campero, Marta Firi, and Adicha John Rodriguez for your valuable uh, inputs and reflections this afternoon. Your reflections have made us think a lot and also touch our, touch our hearts. Invite us all not only to think, but to act with coherence between our deep convictions of faith, our understanding, and our heart. I also want to thank everyone from all the Catholic NGOs who work at the United Nations and have thought of holding this special webinar of, to evaluate the Climate Change 2023 synthesis report and shed more light on the urgent need to phase out fossil fuels, as we have heard today. In this sense, I invite you all to visit the link that we have just shared in the chat to read the Google form and read the declaration for, from this webinar. Sign it, please also share it with your friends, your network, that would be very appreciated. The declaration to whether, with all your signatures will be presented over the coming dates to the national delegates of our countries at the UN headquarters in New York City, where our NGOs have their presence. Um, you can also view, watch the record of this webinar on the YouTube channel of LSM in the probably after tomorrow. Uh, or if not, we are also share with you uh, the link to the, the record and also the link for the Google form. Thank you very much for your participation, for your patience also, and blessing to you all. Thank you, really. Thank you and a good evening, a good night to everyone.
Oh, good Thank morning you. to people joining us from other other regions. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. A great pleasure.